Oh, well, uh, thank you for inviting me, Dion. Uh, this talk isn't very long. I gave it once, um, so I know it should be only about 10, 15 minutes. So if any of you wants to stand up and deliver a five-minute harangue about De Finetti, like uh, the guy at my last talk, then uh, you are, you'll have plenty of time. Um, the slide, uh, the talk wasn't for a networks conference, so I have this uh, slide explaining about networks. Um, I'm just dealing with undirected networks here. That's all I want to say about that. The problem that I got um, was um, we have a network, and each node in it has an attitude score, which is given to us uh, between 0 and 10. But we don't know the attitude scores for most of the nodes. So one of the problems is that I don't know what the data represents. But I assume you could think of it as being a network of uh, criminals and the attitudes are how uh, bad they are, something like that. Um, and what we want to do, uh, we don't know the attitude scores for many of the nodes, so we want to guess what those should be, and that's called imputation. Um, so there are various reasons why this is difficult. In this particular case, um, so uh, as I said, I'm not too sure what the data is supposed to represent, because it's secret. Uh, now, I don't know what a typical data set looks like, because I only had one example data set that was declassified enough to play with. And for that data set, uh, we only have 395 nodes, and 272 of the attitude scores are missing. So there's quite a lot of missing attitude scores in this network. And most importantly, um, the client wants to know, for some reason, what the attitude score should be for the missing nodes. But I don't know why they want to know. Um, and obviously, uh, if you don't have the final thing that you're trying to find out in mind when you're doing it, um, it's not clear how you should proceed. It makes it more challenging. Um, so this, welcome to the cloak and dagger world of uh, international tax. It's very exciting. Uh, so my approach, um, rather than using the data, because I didn't have very much, uh, was to do a model based on general theory and then give it to the client and uh, see whether it was useful. Um, so certainly, uh, because we have a network here, it must be expected that your attitude is somehow related to the attitudes of the people to whom you're connected. Um, so we want to use that in some way. Um, now, there's this standard model for how an epidemic spreads on a network, which is that uh, it goes through time. Um, at each particular time step, each of the nodes in your network is either infected or not infected. So it's just a zero, one thing. And then the probability for you of being infected in the next time step is uh, given by the number of your neighbors who are infected, if you're not infected already. Um, so that's an idea for how an epidemic spreads on a network. I think it's quite a standard uh, model. And um, hopefully, uh, you could treat these attitude scores as maybe the probability that you're infected, something like that. So the attitude scores are in the range from 0 to 10. So we could think of them as normalized on the uh, interval from 0 to 1. And uh, maybe we could use a model like this in some way to um, try and find out what the missing attitude score should be. You can't directly use this model because it doesn't make sense in the context of the problem. But uh, what, I, uh, what I did was uh, just use it as inspiration, so I thought, Maybe if we knew uh, the probabilities of everyone being infected, or which were the infected individuals, we could think of our attitude scores as coming from that uh, when it was advanced by one time step into the future. So that was the idea behind this. Um, so what we do is we assume we have some measure of degree of infection with values in the interval from 0 to 1 for each of the nodes in our network. And then we assume the attitude scores are given by something like this, where um, your attitude depends both on how infected you are and how infected your neighbors are. So that's what this is saying. And those have been normalized. They lie in the range from 0 to 10, which is what we wanted. So the idea is you find these uh, RIs, which are sort of latent information, and then reconstruct the attitude score from those. Um, and this will give you an attitude score for every node, not just the ones uh, which you already had. So you choose the RIs in such a way that... Um, they generate the attitude scores that you have, and then from the same RIs, you try and reconstruct 
the attitude scores of the missing, uh, the nodes for which the attitude is missing. This is a very uh, simple model because you can express the attitude scores just as a matrix times the RIs. So the idea is we find the RIs uh, and then this matrix is known because it's just given by um, part of the adjacency matrix I graph and uh, then once we find the RIs we can use the equation from the previous slide to get the attitude scores for the missing nodes. Um, so to find the RIs we have to solve this problem. We want to a matrix B times R is equal to A with the constraint that the RIs have to be between 0 and 1. Um, it's quite easy to solve. Uh, I didn't realize, but it's a convex problem. So um, you just need to find a local minimum, and uh, it will be a global minimum. Um, so you can do that numerically. There's probably a better way of doing it, uh, but I haven't found out about that yet. Uh, and then you impute your missing attitude scores like that. And what's good about it is if you start it from a random choice of RIs and then uh, find a minimizer, then, for example, if you had a node that was completely separate from the rest of the network, its RI would never be affected. Um, so um, by starting with random starting points, you can get uh, an, a feel for how uncertain the results are. For example, um, if you're completely uncertain, then you'll find if you do it maybe 100 or 1,000 times, you'll get a uniform distribution for the attitude scores for that particular node. So that's quite convenient. Um, here's an example. It's not real data. Uh, it's just a simulated network where I've randomly put in some attitude scores. So here the red ones are the uh, ones with high attitude scores, and the very green ones are the ones with low attitude scores. Um, and then I've left out uh, a bunch of attitude scores, and this is what the result is of the imputation. So you, if you look at it, um, you should see that most of them look reasonably sensible. Like, for example, um, this one here is quite brown uh, here. The one next to it is sort of reddish brown, so that's probably OK. Um, it doesn't perfectly reconstruct the original attitude scores, uh, but uh, it's pretty close. And anyway, um, we don't really want to. Um, measure it using in-sample performance, but obviously we'd like it to match the ones we've already seen. Um, so that's basically uh, how it works. And uh, the real problem was how to evaluate the results, because as I said, we only had one data set. So all I could really do was give it to the client and ask if it was OK. Um, now, uh, one thing is we're actually fitting uh, all these RIs, so there are n of those, one for each node in the network. Um, so that, that's going to be a massively overfitted model. So uh, just looking at how well it fits the known attitude scores is uh, not going to be very useful because it will probably fit them quite well. Um, usually, uh, we measure the performance of the algorithm using cross-validation in some way. But um, So for example, we'd, we take a network, uh, delete give it some attitude scores, delete some of them, and then see if we could recover the deleted ones, or how well we could recover the deleted ones. Um, but in this case, uh, that's going to be quite tough, because um, there's only one example. I, I'm not too sure how you should do this with network data, what you should actually be deleting. So I was a bit confused about that, so I, um, I didn't really do that. Um, and then importantly, um, we also want to think about how we should evaluate the performance of our of our imputation method anyway. Like, is, it, is a 6 as good as a 7 or not? Um, sum of squared errors uh, isn't very useful as a, uh, a measure of how well it performs, because um, if you square the error, uh, everything is going to come out to be a 5, basically, um, because you're, you're only looking at values between 0 and 10. And sum of absolute errors is problematic for other reasons. And also, um, maybe the end user doesn't even care. They might just categorize things as uh, small, uh, medium, or big, you know, they might not care where it is on a scale from 0 to 10. So you have to think about that as well. Um, but uh, all that being said, um, it was OK as far as I know. Um, the feedback I got was um, it will be of real practical use straight away. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so I was quite happy that it, uh, it turned out to be useful, which was the main thing. Um, yeah, so uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, well, um, I think it's a social looking network, sort of scale free uh, with uh, a core of highly connected individuals and then some preferential attachment type things. Yeah, so I, I'm expecting that it will be applied to similar networks. And uh, the one I tried to simulate here was sort of like that. Um, I just started by simulating a network with preferential attachment, and it didn't look very good. So I started sticking edges in uh, in the middle there, um, and then it became a bit of a mess, so I, uh, I stopped before. Um, I wanted to make sure it had some of these, uh, these tendrils uh, sticking out. Yeah. I think that's the kind of network that uh, it might be applied to. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and uh, the original version, I think, uh, that the guy was doing was using network statistics. And uh, I certainly think we could probably incorporate that as well and uh, use more than one model. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what he origi was originally doing. But I don't know if it was quite the same as yours. But he was using all these things like clustering coefficients and things to try and uh, um, do the imputation. Yeah. Um, well, it's very hard to tell, uh, not knowing what kind of data it's going to be applied to. That's the big problem. Uh, certainly, if we knew, like, I'm sure whatever data set it will be applied to uh, will be coming from somebody who knows a lot about the subject area. Um, so they might be able to choose a model based on that kind of knowledge. Um, but uh, the way I was presented with the problem, um, it might not even be about tax. In fact, I think the networks come from the police, but I'm not totally sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, the, the lack of domain knowledge is a big problem. I'm sure if we had some more of that available, then, um, then uh, we could find a better model. Yeah. Is, is there a way to tune it so that you, I, I would guess if you're using police work, you care a lot about false negatives versus false positives? Or? Yeah, I mean, if you were actually using it to catch criminals. Um, there was a tuning parameter in the formula. Uh, but I just set it to be one. Um, yeah. And, and that could adjust I, I, one is a nice number. Sorry? Sorry? Do you know if that would adjust positives versus negatives? Um, well, I think if it was zero, then um, it would just be a free for all, right? So that sort of measures the amount, the extent to which you're influenced by your neighbors. If you made the speeder very large, then the influence of the neighbors is. Uh, well, I did try it with um, beta being infinity, actually, because I, I left out this RI term. Um, that model wasn't so good. Uh, I got feedback about both of those. Yeah. So the beta equals infinity and beta equals one versions I actually presented to the client, and uh, we preferred the uh, the one with this extra term here. We could look at um, large values of beta that weren't that were bigger than one, maybe, and uh, think about um, increasing the influence of the neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Would you go and ask for something general like um, what is this network describing so that it's not actually giving you that natural information but telling you maybe about the processing or would you be asking for sort of some network mm. problems or... Mm, yeah. No, I, I think probably the main knowledge is the most important thing in, uh, in any statistical problem. So that would be, that would be the one thing, yeah. Uh, 